Yes, I'll be showing and voice also we can hear. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So I was just saying these are things that we've learned over 30 years. When I joined Glaucoma, I thought, you know, uh, or what, what we were taught was that if you control the IOP to 20, you were doing a great job. I think we also at that time didn't know how much of angle closure we were seeing. I think over the time, I think in Asia, we are all aware that uh, one third of the eyes that we are likely to see in a hospital are angle closure. If we look at what is stable glaucoma, I think this is a new definition last year, which says that the IOP remains within the target you decide on three or less than three medications. And there's no further visual loss, but it doesn't say whether it's for three years or four years or, or as far as the patient is concerned, he would like for a lifetime. So there are many things that we actually need to do to uh, sort of it, it change this uh, scenario as far as stabilization of glaucoma is concerned. So we, if we actually look at the many things we need to do, as I said, the first was to know what we are actually treating. And there are many studies from India and I think from across Asia that have shown that angle closure is very significant. So we should be able to pick it up early. Secondary glaucomas are one third of the glaucomas that we see in the hospital. And I think this is something that we should be aware of. Unfortunately, the bad thing that we see is that a lot of patients still come to us bilaterally blind. So I think we are well placed at the moment to try and do something about these statistics. Early diagnosis, of course, being most important, I think on anterior chamber examination, looking for a shallow AC, looking at the fundus specifically for the inferior or inferior temporal thinning, doing uh, an examination of both eyes, even if one eye seems to uh, show us that there is a thinning, but there's no parametric defect. The other eye may actually show us a more significant defect. And you can see there's an associated uh, RNFL defect that can be seen. And corresponding to that, there's a visual field defect. Gonioscopy is extremely important in Asia, in India, because we do see half the cases we see are likely to be due to, to angle closure. And if we can make out that there's an open angle as compared to an angle, which is where the, the, the corneal wedge is adjoining the iris, we can actually pick up even a single uh, peripheral anterior synecae or blotchy pigment. And if we treat it at this time, we can prevent the glaucomatous optic neuropathy from occurring. So if we sort of do the early diagnosis, the question next is what are we going to do about treatment? I think target IOP uh, can be based on what we see on the optic nerve head, but is much better um, documented as far as visual field effects are concerned. We have to ensure that there's adherence to therapy. We have to keep looking at what other systemic medications people are taking. Very often we find that whatever we do with the control of IOP is upset because somebody is taking uh, a, a steroid ointment for a, uh, for a problem on his little toe or has been advised inhalers for asthma and been told inhalers will cause no problem with your glaucoma. And finally, I would say that we must take resort to early surgery if we find our medications don't work. So if we look at all stages, let's start with ocular hypertension. This can occur in either uh, eyes with open angles or in eyes with primary angle closure where some amount of damage has occurred to the trabecular meshwork. So we tend to treat patients with ocular hypertension whose IOP is more than 26 because this is going to actually lead to venous problems, retinal venous problems if we don't treat it. We did a study where over 10 years, we aimed for all these patients to have a target IOP of less than 18. And over time, over the, uh, 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 a, a period of seven to 14 years, what we found was that those with the open angles, only 5% actually progressed if we could keep it down to this. On the other hand, the angle closure showed us much more progression, probably because of the associated damage that was there in the trabecular meshwork and the additional age-related changes. And what we found was that a lot of patients were using steroids inadvertently. We found that those in whom we needed more than three drugs to reach a, a target IOP of less than 18 were also more likely to progress. So uh, what we would suggest in ocular hypertensives is the uh, additional use of imaging because the imaging showed us changes that were prior to the visual field effect in, more, in most patients between two and four years earlier. 
From the ocular hypertension who had a normal uh, optic nerve head, we moved to a damaged optic nerve head. And most of them, as uh, Professor Islam said, we start with very high pressures. Are we then thinking of 21? Or what is it that we'd like to resort to to keep this optic nerve functioning, at least to whatever uh, it is when it comes to us? So when a patient comes to a glaucoma specialist, the aim these days should be it should not get worse. There are many things that have been done. There are randomized control studies, all of which confuse us thoroughly because some look at percentage reduction, some look at IOPs. And even though they say no progression, what they actually mean is equal numbers progressed and equal numbers remained stable or improved so that at the end, the mean was a no progression. So what we tended to do was we said, okay, 21, 20 is probably too high. We looked at patients over five years in whom for the severe glaucomas, this is by the uh, Mills criteria of five earliest, early, moderate and advanced uh, um, glaucoma or glaucomatous defects. In the severe glaucomas, we said, let's keep it less than 12. And for all the others, we thought, you know, between 15 and 18 was a good number. And we were actually surprised to find that the earliest didn't show much uh, progression. The severe didn't show much progression because we were keeping them at, at less than 12, but everything else showed about a 20% 20, 20 progression, which we thought was very high. So we then revised the target IOP and we found when we were doing this, that it'd be actually lower than what the Canadian guidelines have suggested. So for an early defect, we then moved to the HODAP Parish Anderson, which is easier to, uh, to actually use clinically. So in an early defect, one hemisphere, probably just a nasal step, you're going to look at 15 to 17 millimeters of mercury, whatever you start with. If it's a moderate loss of the visual field, that is between 25 and 50% of the loci are involved, one hemisphere, maybe one point in the central field, 12 to 15. And if it's severe, what we're going to see is we are going to try for a pressure of between 10 and 12 millimeters. After 10 years, what we looked at, we found that most eyes, most eyes, regardless of where they started off from, they actually did very well. Even the most severe glaucomas did well. And what was more important was that we remembered to look at the better eyes so that we actually had patients with good binoc binocular fields. The algorithm we used was, we would start with the first line, make sure it worked, then a second, then a third. But when it came to maximal medical therapy, which was basically three bottles, two fixed drug combinations and one other. And if it didn't reach target IOP, we were very happy to consider surgery and have it done. So what we found when we did this for open angle glaucomas, we found that we were able to reduce the IOP significantly, about 30% needed surgery and about 11% progressed. But what was most important that only two or three loci actually showed us a significant change. And this was very similar to what we found with PACG. Again, the IOPs were much higher than POAGs, but we brought them down to uh, a similar target IOP, depending on how severe the visual field effect was. About 25% needed trabeculectomy, about 11% progressed. There were a, little, a few more who had a three loci sort of involved, but not many went into blindness or visual disability. When we looked at secondary glaucomas, again, we, we took a conscious decision to say, we are going to look at them from the point of view of the visual field effect they had and have similar target IOPs because the optic nerve was also similarly damaged. And when we actually followed them up, we found many more, 40% underwent a trabeculectomy, but only 7% or so actually progressed. One problem with the secondary glaucomas were that some of them had poor vision to start with. So we may not, be, may not have been able to actually show any uh, change in, in, in the visual field, but the visual acuity, whatever it was, remained the same. Similar studies from the UK, looking at 10 years and 20 years, have shown that only 50% remained stable. And even at 20 years, more than 50% actually progressed. And if you look at why this has occurred, probably because the intraocular pressure again, like us earlier, was on the higher side. A US study, again, looking at 15 to 20 years, found that were only 20% were stable. And 43% of them actually showed a significant change. So I think what we have 
tried to say is make it simple, give people numbers that they can follow. And if you actually do that, you can actually stop the progression of the glaucoma. The other thing to remember is that fluctuating of the IOP. This is another thing that we found when we were doing it. If the uh, intervisit IOP fluctuation was more than four millimeters of mercury, those were the eyes that progressed. The yellow eyes, as you can see, are the fluctuating IOPs in, in progressing eyes. And the green is where they were non-progressing. Another study by Rao et al. has also sort of tried to uh, indicate that a millimeter of, of IOP fluctuation could significantly increase the chances of progression. The possibility is that this is telling us the patient is not very compliant. It's telling us maybe the, uh, the, the adherence is not very good, but that is something that we should look at. Finally, I think we do need to do regular imaging and perimetry at least four or five times in the first couple of years. That will help us to decide whether the patient is a fast or a slow progressor or whether there's no change at all. There are no uh, accepted criteria for progression, but currently the suggested criteria are what I have written over here for visual field index, a change of more than 2%. For an MD, some people suggest 0.5, some suggest more than um, minus one decibel per year. For the OCT, a change of five microns. The reason for us to look at fast and slow progressors is to try and treat them and get them as parallel to the line for the age-related loss. So you can do it for the slow progressors, you can do it for the fast progressors if they're picked up early. So this should be done as quickly as possible, as I said, within one and two years of change. And these are the various sort of studies that are available. But I think the important thing is that rather than trends, the event-based analysis picked up the change earlier and was much more sort of reproducible. So here's a patient who has progressed. As you can see, there was a very thin RNFL defect above, and you can see that widening and giving us a defect in the inferior hemisphere. So what do we do once patients progress? You've got the, the uh, imaging done as well, and ideally we should have looked hard at the imaging and prevented that progression from occurring. So when it does occur, you have to reassess your target IOP. It may go up, it may go down, but the aim is that you reassess the target. Okay, this patient came to us for two, two visits and then disappeared. When he came, he had progressed. So at this point in time, despite medications, he was not actually reaching what we thought was the appropriate target IOP. So we quickly did a surgery. At that time, whenever you reassess the target and you change the target, please also reset your baseline so that you know that the baseline from now on can be checked from the point at, view, uh, at which you have changed your target IOP. And this can be customized, customized on any perimetry or imaging device. So to end, what I would like to say is I think the USA had shown us that you know in 40 years, they have reduced the incidence of glaucoma blindness uh, considerably even though the prevalence was very similar. So what I would suggest to all of us in Asia is that we need to work on early diagnosis. We need to give our, our, our very clear messages about numbers, you know, less than 18 for early, less than, sorry, less than 17 for early, less than 15 for moderate, and less than 12 millimeters of mercury for um, severe glaucomas. And this has been shown, we have shown this repeatedly that you can keep the patients um, stable, not over two or three years, but over 10 years or 15 years as well. Make sure the patient that you're advising the medications can actually afford the medications. A lot of our patients are too poor, they cannot afford it. Think in terms of early surgery. If despite three medications, you know, the IOP is on the higher side, again, think very quickly of early surgery. Please avoid, uh, warn all your patients to avoid steroids. I think in, in Asia, <clears throat> it is available over the counter and is a bugbear as far as glaucoma management is concerned. Look to see whether the patient is stable, whether there's a change, and if the change is there, <clears throat> is it fast or slow? And please reassess target after two years. I'd just like to say that this is really well possible if we do these few things. I think we can really make a difference to our glaucoma patients. I would just like to thank everybody.